Recognition of the severity of the climate crisis has markedly increased in recent years. While some progress has been made in reducing greenhouse gas emissions across certain sectors and communities, global emissions hit record highs prior to the recent drop caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Emissions must now be reduced by over 7% each year over this decade to get the world on track to limiting temperature increases to 1.5 degrees centigrade, a point underscored by a new wave of climate activists over the past couple of years. In turn, fears are growing that increasingly unmanageable climate change is becoming unavoidable. In this episode, we explore the status of the climate crisis. And to do so, I'm joined by Dr. Michael E. Mann, a globally renowned climate expert who is currently Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Science at Penn State, Director of the Penn State Earth System Science Center, and who was recently elected to the USA's National Academy of Sciences. Mike, welcome. Uh, thanks, it's great to be with you. Let's start off with the current situation. So global temperatures have risen by over 1.1 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial average or thereabouts. Has anything about the climate system's journey to this point surprised scientists or is this temperature rise largely what the models predicted we'd reach at this level of cumulative emissions? Yeah, we're about where the models predicted we would be at this point. Um, you might argue we're a little closer to 1.2 degrees, and it depends on you know, some technical questions about how you define the, the pre-industrial baseline. And we've published some, some work on that ourselves. And so we might be as, as high as 1.2 degrees Celsius at this point. And obviously, if we're trying to uh, avoid crossing the 1.5 degree Celsius threshold, uh, there isn't a uh, a, a lot of wiggle room there. There isn't much um, of uh, a, a margin for error. And so, as you already alluded to, we need to bring uh, carbon emissions down dramatically, uh, more than 7% a year for the next decade. Uh, so the warming of the surface of the planet is proceeding more or less as we expect. Um, on the other hand, there are other aspects of climate change, which in fact are happening faster and uh, where the magnitudes are greater than we expected at this point. Uh, that is true for the melting of ice uh, and the collapse of the major ice sheets. And, and of course, as the ice sheets collapse uh, into the oceans, uh, that adds to a global sea level rise. And global sea level rise now is beginning to exceed uh, some of our earlier projections. Some of the work that my colleagues and I have done in recent years uh, looks at the connection between climate change and extreme weather events, uh, the sorts of uh, devastating extreme floods and droughts and heat waves and wildfires that we've seen break out around the planet in recent years. Uh, to some extent, that goes beyond what we expected to see at this point. And in each of these cases, what that comes down to is that our models are imperfect, uh, and there are processes relevant to ice melt or to how climate change influences the behavior of the jet stream that aren't perfectly represented in the models. And as the models become more realistic, as we get more of these processes into the models, we're finding that in fact, in many cases, the changes can happen faster, that the system's more dynamic than we originally envisioned. And so the bottom line here is that uncertainty is not our friend. Uh, if anything, it's actually cutting, us, uh, cutting against us. And when we look then at 1.5, there has been this narrative that grew up in large part by the media's framing of the IPCC's 1.5 report that was released uh, toward the end of 2018, uh, that we have this with 12 years to save the world, and that sort of alludes to this sort of cliff edge type situation as we head to and beyond 1.5 degrees. Now that's not the case. 1.5 is something that we've provided as, a, as almost an artificial line that we're, we're trying to reach as an aspirational target. Can you talk us through a bit more what kind of things we could anticipate to occur as we head to and potentially in the direction we're going at the moment beyond that 1.5 degree threshold. You know, and, and as you say, it's a somewhat arbitrary threshold and, and this isn't a cliff that we go off at one and a half degrees Celsius. I think of it as more like a minefield that we're walking out onto and the farther we go out onto that minefield, uh, the more danger we encounter. And so uh, if you like, uh, you can think of it as a highway. We're going down the the carbon highway, and we have to get off at the soonest exit that we possibly can. And we may miss the 1.5 degrees Celsius exit. That doesn't mean we don't try to get off at the 1.6 uh, exit, because it isn't a cliff, it's continuous. The more we warm the planet, uh, the more carbon pollution we put into the atmosphere, the worse it gets. 
Um, and the converse is true as well. Um, every ton of carbon that we don't put into the atmosphere uh, makes things a little better. And so the, the goal here is to decarbonize uh, our economy as quickly as possible, uh, but we're already encountering dangerous climate change. If you're asking, you know, where, you know, wh where do we uh, begin to encounter dangerous impacts? Well, if you're California or Australia uh, that have experienced unprecedented wildfires, or Europe and North America, the extreme heat uh, that we're seeing again this summer, um, unprecedented floods, superstorms, devastating superstorms like Maria that, uh, uh, that, that uh, struck um, Puerto Rico, uh, a devastating event a few years ago. Um, the worst flooding events on record in the U.S. associated with Hurricane Harvey uh, making landfall near Houston a few years ago, Hurricane Florence um, making landfall in the Carolinas. Um, and so by any measure, we are seeing dangerous impacts of climate change. The, the rule of thumb that I like to use is that if we go down, you know, we continue to go down uh, the road of what we, we might call business as usual, where, you know, that we don't successfully implement global, um, you know, agreements to uh, dramatically reduce carbon emissions, and we blow past 1.5, and then we blow past two degrees Celsius. By the middle of this century, we're looking at a planet where the sorts of events that we think of as almost unprecedented and extreme become commonplace what we might think of today as you know, an extreme summer heat wave, we will just call a summer day um, mm -hmm. by the middle of the century if we go down this road. And of course, uh, we will see more inundation, we'll see retreat from our coastlines in Florida, along the east coast of the US, the low countries of Europe, low-lying island nations, coastlines around the world. Um, if we don't act by the middle of this century, the impacts that we start to see you know, reasonably resemble some of our sort of worst uh, predictions, uh, if you will, even some of the dystopian futures that have been presented uh, by Hollywood. Um, you know, if that's one possible future, uh, but it doesn't have to be our future. We so can still act. Right, so taking the current moment then, as we are, this much further up the carbon highway before we start to get to those possible futures. We've had a lot of, of campaigners, businesses, governments, politicians, others calling for the need for change as a result of the current moment, of the disruption the pandemic's brought us. And at great cost, particularly human cost, the pandemic is gonna give us some kind of lowering of emissions this year to whatever extent, partly dependent upon the rebound of the economies can take over the year. How do you think this moment of enormous opportunity could, should, and, and may well play out? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I have a book coming out in January and the thesis uh, on the, the new climate war. Um, and it's about the challenges we face now as we get away from outright climate change denial, but we're encountering other efforts to sort of slow down this transition by fossil fuel interests. Um, and uh, indeed, um, by uh, you know uh, the end of this year, we will see a drop in, in carbon emissions by, between four to seven percent. Uh, but that's that alone isn't going to get us where we need to to be. Um, that lockdown, uh, as you know, the the economy, the global economy, uh, transportation sector in particular, ramps back up. We're going to lose that temporary uh, reduction that we had achieved. And let's remember that we've got to achieve those reductions year after year for the next 10 years without a pandemic, um, without uh, the fundamental behavioral changes that we've seen in response to the pandemic. Um, and that means that individual behavioral change alone isn't gonna get us there. We need fundamental systemic change and governmental policies that will get us where we need to go. And what I was alluding to before, um, the thesis of, of the new climate war is very much what you just spoke to here. We do, you know, despite some of the challenges we have today and you know, the president of the United States who's a climate change denier and has done everything possible to sort of interfere with in international efforts to reduce carbon emissions, basically doing the bidding of the fossil fuel interests that put him in power. Uh, but in a few months, we've got an election here in the United States. And there's reason to believe that we are going to move in a, a new direction and that climate is gonna be at the top of the agenda. We just saw 
uh, presidential candidate, Democratic presidential candidate uh, Joe Biden yesterday put forward a very bold vision for climate action in his uh, you know, prospective administration. Uh, the House Democrats have put forward a very bold climate plan and it's possible that we will have a political environment here in the United States where that plan can actually move through and become law. Uh, and if it does happen, it's because of the things you spoke to, this uh, remarkable uh, coalescence of you know, this renewed uh, global advocacy and activism on climate led by uh, the children, uh, led by Greta Thunberg and other youth climate activists who have really recentered this conversation where it needs to be on issues of intergenerational ethics. Um, and we've seen devastating, you know, extreme weather events that have made it very clear to the person on the street that uh, climate change is here. Um, and uh, this is the face of climate change. We're already seeing the devastating impacts. Uh, that has created a new realization, a new recognition of the fundamental nature of the challenge that we face. And we do see this shift in our politics. And then finally, a pandemic, which as we just said, the, the lockdown response and the social distancing and the reduction in transportation that came with the pandemic alone isn't going to get us where we need to go. But it is creating, along with these other developments, an opportunity to have a larger conversation about what sort of world do we want. I think the pandemic has allowed us to reflect a little bit on both our, um, uh, on uh, our, uh, how our vulnerability um, uh, uh, on a, a planet with uh, you know 7.8 billion and growing people with diminishing food and water and livable space um, and the challenge that that poses to a sustainable future. I think the pandemic has actually opened a conversation that will naturally evolve to this larger conversation now about what sort of planet we want to leave behind for our children and grandchildren. Right, and, and the, the positive sum policies that exist out there for all of us on that planet to make sure that we can do that, right? Absolutely. As I like to say, we now see that there is great urgency, but there is also agency. We can all be part of this solution. We can make a better future. And as a, as a last question on that then, you mentioned earlier how as we start to move beyond, at least in some quarters, the narratives of denial, you've often pointed to other Ds that uh, could stimmy action on climate. So you've talked about delay, you've talked about deflection, and I think more recently you've talked about doomism. And when it comes to that, how do we make sure that we keep this balance between on the one side recognizing the high stakes, as you said, the, the carbon pathway, which at some point into the future leads us to the Hollywood star situation. How do we, on one hand, make sure that people are aware of the threat, while on the other, ensuring that no matter where we get on that carbon highway, no matter where we find ourselves and how terrible that may be, we can still be pushing to get us off that highway. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's critical. And that's why, again, I always pair, you know, the urgency with the agency. Um, we, let's recognize that climate change, you know, is an existential threat to human civilization, that we do have to act dramatically and boldly now. But the fact is that there is still time. Um, it would be very depressing if there weren't. And as a scientist, I would find it difficult to be out there talking about the challenge and what we need to meet to do to meet it um, if, if I felt like um, I was uh, not being earnest in you know, uh, where we are and, and, and what opportunities are still available to us. Uh, but you know, I spend much of my time crunching the numbers, looking at the model output, um, doing the math, and as a result of that, I and other climate scientists know that there is still time to avert the worst. We can, in fact, still avoid one and a half degrees Celsius warming of the planet. And even if we miss that target, uh, certainly two degrees Celsius. And that's a whole, you know, uh, that's a much better world than a four degree world or a five degree world. So it's, as I like to say, some, you know, some of my more uh, dour colleagues uh, have been known to say, you know, to at times to break down and say, we're effed, we're mm -hmm. effed-worded. <laughs> um, and, and my response to that is, no, it's a matter of how effed we, yeah. we, we want to be. Uh, it's a matter at this point of how bad we're willing to let it get. But we are not yet at a point where we are committed to civilization ending climate change. And to me, that's empowering. And I try to communicate that. Um, again, to communicate the urgency of acting now with the agency that's still available to us. Right. 
And Mike, I think on that note, it's a perfect place to finish. And thank you so much for joining us today and talking with us. Uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you.